I'd like to welcome uh, any visitors. We're always grateful to have anyone who might come and worship and visit with us. We are grateful to have you. This morning, we're going to be partaking of the Lord's table together at the end of the service. So what we're going to do is we are going right now, if you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, we're looking at verses 4 through 12. We'll continue our study there this morning. We're looking at this beautiful picture that Peter's giving us of what the church is. We're looking at God's design for it and His purpose for it. And so Peter is doing it by a way of showing the beautiful fulfillment of this New Testament temple. And and this, this metaphor that he's been giving us, he's showing us it's now a spiritual temple. So it's not like that Old Testament temple. Now our cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came into the world. He lived and he died on a cross for us. The cornerstone has been laid. And now the church is going to be built upon that And Peter says, we are living stones. We come to Jesus Christ and he makes us alive. And we are now those who the temple is being built with believers in Jesus Christ as he's building up this temple. And he says, now we're the priest. We're those who have access to God and we come and we offer up spiritual sacrifices. And then in verses six through eight, we saw that there's only two responses that you can do then to this cornerstone. You either stumble over him your whole life, you you trip, you reject him, or or you believe and you entrust your life to him and you find eternal life. It says the one who believes in him will not be disappointed. You will never be disappointed if you come to the cornerstone and you put your faith in him. This morning we will take up verses 9 through 10 uh, and it's, it's hit me even deeper studying this week of why I've chosen to give my life to the bride of Christ, the church. This is God's design now, this temple, to be the proclamation of His name. It's, it's how the world will see uh, God. He will see Him through living stones coming together. This is where He's put on display by His members. This is what the gates of hell, Jesus said, will never overcome. It just keeps continuing the church to move on victorious. Its flame has not been put out throughout all of history. Every time it looks like it's starting to flicker, the gasoline of the cornerstone is poured on it again and the glory fills the temple again through each generation. I recently spent a year teaching and preaching in what's called a parachurch organization to come alongside the church. And it was with a bunch of college students at Denver University, and it was a great blessing. Nothing is more satisfying than to walk onto a liberal campus and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the room that they provided for you, unhindered, unfettered. And to see all these clubs on campus as we walked in there with these little small groups meeting, we started with about five, and we ended with from 60 to 70 students, uh, college students and athletes. Uh, gathering together to hear the Word of God. It was beautiful. But with all of that, there was something missing. Very few of them were plugging in to the church. And they began to make that group their church. And because of the beauty of God's design and His promise and His presence to the church, sin begins to enter in. You don't have uh, elders. Uh, People come up with new ideas how we can do it better and more effective. And if you don't love the church and plug into it, they they graduate and they slowly drift because church is not like what it was like in college in this group where you got to hang out every day and just be together. And I just keep watching this play out again and again. And so what I want you to see is that the church is God's plan to put on display His glory. And we will see again today that He planned it before the foundation of the world. He designed it to save people, to grow them, we use the word sanctify, and to put his name on display to the nations. This is his bride that he shed his blood for. So I have no problem with a parachurch. I love the gospel going out in any way possible, but if it doesn't truly feed the church in God's program, I worry for its power and duration and its effectiveness. So there's one thing that God has chosen to put on display, His glory. The one thing that He has promised, again, that the gates of hell will not overcome, and that is the church of God. And so as we begin this morning, I'll ask you, do you love it? Do you love it? 
uh, uh, has, has, has been driven home into your hearts? Have you given yourself to the bride of Christ? This is how God grows his people. This is how God puts his name on display. Have you given yourself to it? That's his design in it. It says the body will cause the growth of the body. All of our gifts will be working together to build us up into the head. And for some of you, the answer is no. And our text this morning has a a demand for a resounding yes. Well, the church is truly in an identity crisis today. We really just don't know who we are. We don't know even what we should be about. As many, it's the focus should be the worship. And we're trying to to have such contemporary worship and all our focus is, is on that. Uh, others would say, no, it's only about edification where you come and you get taught. There's another who say it should just be about evangelism and missions to take this thing to the world, the gospel. Others would come and they come and say, we need to be about feeding the hungry. Uh, we, we need to get into the, the politics and we need to affect our, our country and make sure that moral, good people are running our country We need to clean up the city. We need to have social justice. And the question then is, what what is it? What are we to be about? And I heard a preacher this week say, don't don't ask that first. The first thing we should ask, uh, don't say, what should we be doing? But the first question is, who are we? Who who are we as the church of God? And if we don't ask that question, we're just going to follow the whims of the time that we live in, and we'll just keep moving about, shooting at nothing. Social justice is in right now. Let's be about that. Ten years from now, something else will be the main focus. Thirty years ago, there was a church growth movement that came into the church that basically uh, the question was, what do we need to do to get people in the door? So let's make the world look like the church so that people will start coming into it. And it went on for 30 years and now it's dead because it didn't grow people deep in the Lord and they were apathetic and it just fell apart. And so we just keep following all of these whims. Sure enough, the fruit is done. And so the, 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 the emergent church replaced it. And now we're going to replace the building with a coffee shop. We're going to go to pubs and not a sanctuary. We're going to be hip millennials. So how do we navigate all this stuff that keeps coming at us? How do I as a shepherd stand when every visitor, everyone who walks in this church has a different view of what the church should be? So I stand before you this morning and say the question is not what shall we be doing, but the primary question is who are we? Being precedes doing, but I'm going to go even further. Art Azurdi has said being determines doing. So who we are will determine what we do. Who we are as a church will determine what we will do as a church. And so who we are is what we shall be doing. And so the simple question that has taken up the church for the last 2,000 years, uh, what we should be doing is what I'm going to take on this morning. So pray for your pastor. (laughs) He could use a little help. All right, thank you. So the outline that we've been looking at is four elements to understand the temple of God today in verses 4 through 12. Our first sermon was on the construction of the temple, cornerstone, uh, living stones being made alive, and all of that. Then we looked at the foundation of the temple last week from the Old Testament that this cornerstone is the one that you, it's either going to, there's a thief on each side. One is making fun of Jesus. The other says, remember me today in paradise. There'll always be two kinds of people on each side of this cornerstone, mockers and those who surrender their lives to this Christ. This morning, we're going to look in verses 9 through 10 now. Then what's the significance of this temple? Look with me in verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So let's look in verse 9, but you. And I love this simple phrase, it's something adversative, but is in contrast to what he just said. So what is he contrasting? He's contrasting those who disbelieve, those who have rejected the cornerstone, who stumbled over it, and he said, who are apathetic to the word of God. So in contrast to that group, you on the complete other side, this is in the plural, which means church of God. 
You're another kind of people. You're not that. You're not those who reject and see no value in Jesus and stumble over him. You're the opposite of that. You're those who see him as precious, he said, in the verses we've already looked at. So you are a chosen people, he said in 1.1. You are the materials that God is building his new temple. And you have been chosen. You've been chosen by God to come to the choice one, Jesus Christ, and be made a living stone and now placed in the temple of God. So what I want you to understand this morning, church of God, you are not plan B. Something did not go wrong and now God is trying to fix it. Israel failed, now let's try the church. The church, it's not a parenthesis in redemptive history. This is God's glorious design to bring the nations into the new covenant through the cornerstone. He has been moving history all the way throughout it to this place, a worldwide salvation that would come by faith in Jesus Christ. So the temple pictured this spiritual one. Israel, there's a promise of blessing that would come to you through Abraham. He says, through your seed, singular, which would be Jesus Christ. And all the nations will be blessed through that seed that comes. And now the gospels go into the nations. Guys, the stone has been placed. This has been the plan throughout all of history. And God said, lengthen the, lengthen the tent pegs so that now the nations can come in to this temple to worship God. It is time to gather in the nations. And now we are a holy nation, Jew and Gentile, who have come to this cornerstone. And so this is very climactic. Do you realize what the church of God is? The church does not replace Israel. This is part of the fulfillment of all that what God says he promised and the seed and what would come to Israel. This is why we are called sons of Abraham if we believe or we're of the true circumcision. This is where history has been moving. Israel plays a beautiful role in this history. We're going to see in Romans 9 through 11 that the whole nation is going to come to salvation at the end and we have all these unfolding things that God will do. But there's a national salvation at the end where they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. But don't miss the climactic nature of where history has been moving the church, God's chosen nation from every tribe, tongue, and people. From a seed, Christ, that we believe in, we're brought into this glorious plan of God for all of history. We've been brought into this new temple. It's so beautiful. So let's look at our verse. What are we then, guys? In contrast, this is what we are and I want you to see in verse 9, there's four things. First, you are a chosen people. A chosen people. We are God's chosen people. We are inextricably bound to the chosen one, Christ, right back to where this whole epistle began. And so hear what this is saying, because I don't want anyone to miss this. Before you chose God, he's saying God chose you. And I don't want any confusion if you are not a Christian this morning, you must choose Christ. You must come to this cornerstone, he says, or this cornerstone will crush you on the last day. You must believe and choose and surrender all to him. You must embrace Jesus Christ. You must choose. That is what is laid before you this morning. But don't miss what Peter is telling us in this letter. You choose him because he has chosen you. God has set his love on you in Ephesians 1 before the foundation of the world. And he's, he will open your eyes so that you will either see Christ as lovely or you'll see no value in him. So you will see him, you'll, you'll value a beer more than Jesus Christ. Or you will see him as worth losing your life for. And so if God opens your eyes, you will willfully choose Jesus Christ. So your salvation is owning entirely to God's grace. God did not choose you, catch this, because you were so cuddly and adorable. <laughs> God couldn't help himself. He just had to. I've heard that. That is not true. <laughs> you, you were not choice. That's what I love about this group. Paul says there's not many wise, mighty, or noble in us. There's nothing really special about us. There was uh, no worthiness in us to receive God's grace. That's what's grace. He gave us what we were completely undeserving and unworthy of. You are saved by grace alone by what God has done through Jesus Christ. 
So one ruling disposition then should be the attitude of every church is this, is gratitude. Is that you should always be grateful that God has done this for you. When you hated him, you were going the other way, you did not love him. Gratitude should fill the church. Not haughty, prideful, condescending, judgmental people. That should never be what the church of God is. And it should be a people who are grateful and humble and loving. Commentators said when the church feels this, something sweet emerges like worship that's passionate and vigorous, generosity that is lavish, ministry that is sacrificial, and a people that don't grumble. In America, could you picture that? A people that don't grumble, and they're forever grateful to God. This Peter is telling us what makes the church so alluring is that being determines doing and you're God's chosen people. Second, in verse 9, you're a royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. We don't need priests anymore. We don't need a mediator between us and God, the, the, the one who's just a super saint, someone who's better than us to go represent us before God because we know we can't walk into his presence. That's gone. We are all priests now in this new temple. We all have access right to God, right into his presence. We exist now to serve him. So much more than the Old Testament priest. The priest could go into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, one time a year, make that offering, get out of there as quick as he could. There, there wasn't time to just sit and enjoy. And now in the fulfillment of the new temple, listen to what the writer of Hebrews said. And since we have a great high priest now over the house of God, Jesus Christ, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near to God and enjoy in his presence safe now because of the work of the high priest, Jesus Christ. Priests drawing near again and again to the living stone, guys. We have free access. We bring offerings now, not bulls and goats, but we offer up our bodies, a living sacrifice now to God. And so priests in the Old Testament, they came, they made an offering to do what? To try to appease the anger of God. And now by one sacrifice, he did it completely. He sat down, it's finished. And we don't bring any more offerings to try to get God's anger off of us. It's gone. Because of how God took care of it in his son, we come now and we offer praises of worship. By the mercies of God, we offer up our bodies a living sacrifice. So... Being determines doing. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. Thirdly, in verse 9, you're a holy nation. This was a title that was given to Israel. In Exodus 19, he says, you're a kingdom of priests and you're a holy nation. In Deuteronomy, you're a people holy to their God. And now the church is a holy nation. The church as a nation now, uh, as people of God, it shows our unity the unity, the nation, the people of God. The Greek word really carried the idea of people in community, people sharing a common life together. We, we are now a family. We're a nation. We, we come together in, in absolute community. It's just a crazy title. We're a holy nation. The whole world, everyone who has faith and comes to this cornerstone and trusts in him, we are now a holy nation, Jew and Gentiles, Asians and Hispanics. African and Irish, such diversity all the way around the world, but the commonality of faith in Jesus Christ bonds us together deeper than blood ties. So we are more tight than any family or race ever could be. We have the same father. We're sons and daughters. We have the same brother, Jesus. We are indwelt by the same spirit. We have the same hope and goal, the glory of God in heaven. We are one. We are a holy nation. I want you to see the beauty of what that means here as we are coming from all different places, uh, socioeconomic, nationalities, and we come together and as, as one nation because of our faith in Jesus Christ. So we truly are one nation under God. America's boast is our reality. <laughs> Amen? We're, we are one nation under God. We are a holy nation set apart for God and set apart for his purposes. 
And I'm telling you, selfishness disappears with a people devoted to God's purposes alone. It is not about your personal agenda. It is about God and His agenda. And we are together as one for that agenda. Fourthly, fourthly, we are a people then, he says, for God's own possession in verse 9. And this is such a beautiful picture of all the peoples of the earth. We are chosen, we're holy, and he says now we are God's special possession. The the word carries the idea of really this intimacy, this uh, choosing and desiring over. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul said this, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people in this new covenant. I'm their God, you're my people, we have intimacy, we have fellowship, we walk together. And what is more, that this word meant to acquire us by price. And so he, he paid the ultimate price of his own son on a cross so that we could be his He gave his own son to purchase us so that we would be his bride. And and in 1 Corinthians 6, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. The church is God's most treasured possession. He paid for it by his own son. And so the whole universe is his. And nothing compared to him in this whole universe than his prized possession, you, Jonathan Edwards, the great uh, historian, said, until you know that you are loved like that, you're going to be selfish all of your life. Until this overtakes you and you realize that you are God's own possession. He loves you. He delights over you. He treasures over you in this uh, temple. You're always going to be selfish and your whole life will just be about you. Don't you love the bride of Christ? Guys, you are God's treasured possession that he bought with his own divine blood. Being determines doing. So let me ask you this then. What do we do then? If if that's who we are, what do we do? What should we be doing as a church? Look with me in verse 9. He tells us. He says in the second half of that verse, here's what you do. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what we're to do now as the church of God, as we gather as living stones now, we come together and we're to proclaim to the world and to anyone seeing God is excellent, that he saved sinners like us, changed our natures and caused us to love him and love other people. We, we don't make sense. And so we're putting God's glory on display. And so today there's, there's all this talk about self-identity. I want to find that. It's, it's in the church and outside of it. But listen to Peter, we are not defined uh, by who we are in ourselves, but by what God has done for us, is going to do for us, and what is coming. Identity is not found in a mirror. It's not found in self-analysis, but identity is found by what God has done upon us. We are a chosen one, a priesthood, a holy nation, we're people for God's own possession. So you don't know who you are without defining yourself through God. And what I am then is I'm that, and my life now is not to make much of Ken Murphy. My life is to make much of Jesus Christ. My life now, my identity is His, so I'm just going to make much of Him for all of my days to proclaim His excellencies. That is how you're going to find yourself. But what we are, Church of God is so that God may be known for what He is. So we're going to go show the world what God is like. And the way they're going to see it is that we're going to be being like Him. We're going to be being changed to live and think and act like Him. And so this is so beautiful what we will put on display. We will show the world God's excellencies of who He is. Let us make God known by what He has done for us with amazing grace. This Greek word to to make, uh, let's see, in verse 9, to proclaim, it it means to publish. And and so really we're to go publish God. We're we're to be at, we're walking billboards. (laughs) We're advertisements to show forth a beautiful God by the way we love and care about others. As we gather in community, we pray that God, people would see the excellencies of God in this group. Oh, that we would show forth His excellencies. 
We're to be a reflection of God's actions upon us and toward us, that God would be known in and through us. This gives life to what we do together. We live this out and we bring the world into it. And so I, I want you to live into these realities that people will see the excellencies of God. Believers, people are giving up on the church because this stuff isn't going on anymore. It's a selfish place. It's a judgmental place. They're, they're losing it. And people are just saying, I don't want anything to do with the church. It's, it's, it's dying. And when we do what this tells us right here, it's going to be beautiful. And it's going to show people something lovely. I, I had a buddy of mine. His name's Don. We went to high school together. And he said, why, why should I come to church? I already have enough friends and, and you know, I, don't, I don't need anything else. And I'm like, if that's all the church is, you're right. Why should you come to church? This is a place where we, we come and we put on display the glories of the living God. There's something beautiful that goes on in the bride. So what would happen with a church taken up in its true identity? I'll tell you what would happen. It would proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. How beautiful would that be? Let me close with Peter's illustration to help us out in verse 10. We'll close with this thought. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so this is a quote from the Old Testament from Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. So Peter, why are you closing out with Hosea? Why are you bringing him in here? Why are we going to go back there? Well, I just want to set a little history of Hosea for you real quickly. He was a prophet in the Old Testament, and God says, go marry Gomer. And that's not a good thing to start with. I don't even, don't, don't date a girl named Gomer. I'll, all I can think of is Gomer Pyle. I'm old. That's bad. Okay. So go marry a girl named Gomer and she's a prostitute. And she is going to, they get married and she keeps having adulterous affairs on Hosea. And she even starts having children who are not his. In fact, God gives them a name for one of his kids. And the Hebrew word means not mine. <laughs> Don't use that name either. <laughs> so <laughs> she eventually leaves Hosea. And the man she left him for eventually sells her into slavery. And God comes and says to Hosea, go love your wife again. Go buy her back. Go get her. And so he goes and he pays the price and he purchases Gomer out of slavery and he says, come live with me and I will protect you and I will love you. Isn't that such a beautiful love to such betrayal? But God shows this. He says, this is how my people Israel have been acting towards me. I've loved them. I've, I've given them everything they need to be a fruitful vine. And they've chased harlots. They've chased after other gods. And they've been in idolatry. And here I am and I just keep bringing them back. And they keep spurning and rejecting my love. So he's saying, Hosea, that's a picture of exactly what Israel is doing to me. But in Jesus Christ, God did what he told Hosea to do. He made us for a love relationship. And we turned away from God. I and mean, it says each one of us like sheep have gone astray and we've turned to our own way. And the greater the love, the greater the agony. And so God is agonizing and he sends his own son now to bring back these idolaters who have turned from all of God's pleadings, all the things that he's done, and they've rejected him. Jesus was called a bridegroom and he came to earth and he bought us back, but he, he didn't do it with money like Hosea. He did it with his own blood hanging on a cross till he spilled every last drop of it as a price to redeem his bride, his church, for himself. So that now, those who had not received mercy can now receive the mercy of God, full forgiveness for all of your sins. That those who are not the people of God, Gentiles, can now be brought in as the people of God through this cornerstone and faith in him. Does that fill you with wonder? To the degree that we see this and comprehend it, we will publish the excellencies of God who has poured out such love toward our betrayal. What an amazing God to save people like us. Is this how you think about the church of Christ? 
Is this how you regard the church? Is the church a place where you give your leftovers? I heard a man this week say, it's, it's, we view the church like a, a restaurant. <laughs> you go into a restaurant and you, you enjoy what it gives you. If anything isn't perfect, what do you do? You complain about the service. And if it keeps you satisfied, you will come back. And, and we are so much more than a restaurant. We're a chosen, holy nation, royal priesthood, treasured possession. We are the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. And so the question is, am I prepared to give my life to his bride, to the church, that we would proclaim the excellencies of our God to a world that needs to see it so bad? I pray that we would be that very thing as a bride. Being determines doing. And I just want you to know you are making his marvelous light look really good. I've watched every time there's been a need in this church for 19 years, you've done whatever it takes to meet the needs of the saints. When anyone's hurting, you're there to bring meals. If I go to the hospital, you beat me there. You'll pray for each other. You're discipling each other and teaching. What, what you are doing is you're showing the beauty of a community that loves Jesus over anything else, and, and his marvelous light is being put on display by this body. I love you, and I love what I see in this body. Let's uh, pray, and what we're going to do this morning then is we're going to come together and have communion, and we'll remember our cornerstone and what all this is built on. And even as you remember, I hope that your, your own heart would say, I need to give myself to the bride that he purchased and gave his life for. So I pray that that would be on every one of our hearts, even as we remember this morning. So let's pray, and then I'll ask the ushers to come hand out the elements. Father, we thank you for this book of Peter. I thank you for this temple picture. I thank you that you laid the stone to build the temple, and it was your own son, and you laid him at a great price. God, your word says that he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all when you looked at your own son on a cross, you didn't spare him, but you poured out your full justice so that those who did not receive mercy can now receive mercy. You gave your son justice so we could have mercy. God, we thank you that our sins could be forgiven this way. And I pray, Lord, that you will raise up a church that would get their identity and we would live into the fullness of this and we would proclaim the excellencies of a saving God a God who is gracious and merciful and truthful and just. And I pray that we would put him on display as these stones uh, interact and connect and live together in community. And so, God, we pray that we would be that bright light and we would shine and radiate all of your glory and beauty to a dark and dying world. God, I thank you for meeting us in the word of God here this morning, and I pray that you'll bless our time now at the table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.